أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربي زدني علما اللهم فقهنا في الدين إلهي آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome all all of you to our Ramadan Quran Connect program 2021 and today it's going to be session number 35. So since we're still on just number 29, subhanAllah, um, we're not doing the highlights of just number 30. Inshallah, we're going to cover um, just number 30 tomorrow, inshallah, whatever part we do today and whatever part remains tomorrow, inshallah, we're going to cover all that. <laughs> tomorrow. So we are going to um, start off with a recap, subhanAllah, of the highlighted ayah that um, we're going to discuss, inshallah, today. So since we're about to do Surah Muzzammil, inshallah, so I would like to expound on ayah number one till four. And this is a surah that, inshallah, we are going to discuss today. So let us see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us in this surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal muzzammil, qumi layla illa qalila, nisfahu awin qus minhu qalila, aw zid alayhi wa rattil al-Qur'ana tartila. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you who is wrapped in clothing, Arise, get up to pray at night, except for a little, half of it, or subtract from it a little, or add to it, and recite the Qur'an with a measured recitation. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Now that Ramadan is concluding, our Qur'an sessions are ending. One of the recommendations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for us is Qiyamul Layl. Umar radiallahu an said, one of the things that will be taken away from this ummah is Qiyamul Layl, Salatul Tahajjud, and the raising of voices in Qira'ah, in recitation. And subhanAllah, bitter but true, unfortunately, this is a reality for majority of us. Many of us, we do great in Ramadan in terms of our Qiyamul Layl, in terms of our Taraweeh prayer. But as soon as we encounter Eid, we go back to our snooze mode. And we completely shun this prayer. So as a quick reminder for myself and for all of us, let us uncover some of the special virtues this prayer holds for all of us. So the secret code to unlock Jannah is Qiyamul Layl. SubhanAllah. Abu Huraira radiallahu an reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, what prayer is most virtuous after the obligatory prayers? And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, prayer in the depths of night. SubhanAllah. So, we all want to unlock Jannah, right? We all wish to access Jannah. And when we talk about Qiyamul Layl, we see that SubhanAllah, there are two packages of Qiyamul Layl that we can opt for. SubhanAllah, the standard package and the premium package. And we can choose whichever we want to. The standard package is SubhanAllah most popular amongst the customers. However, it's not the best. So what is the standard package of Qiyamul Layl includes? It includes the minimum night prayer, which comprises of two rakah. So we can make, um, subhanAllah, an effort uh, to wake up 10 minutes, 15 minutes prior to Fajr, and then we can perform these two rakah in order to fulfill the sunnah of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam and be amongst those who pray Qiyamul Layl. And it was the sunnah, uh, the custom of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he would pray eight rakah of Qiyamul Layl and then follow it up with three rakah of Bitr. So all together he would perform 11 rakah. So this is subhanAllah the bare minimum that inshallah we can all try to perform subhanAllah even after Ramadan passes. SubhanAllah, this is something, inshallah, we can optimize on. And this is the standard package. We can start off the two and we can make our way up to the eight. 
So now the question is, subhanAllah, when the standard package itself includes itraqa, then what does the premium package include? Insha'Allah. So let us get affiliated with the premium package. The premium package of Qiyamul Layl includes lengthier recitation of Quran. So it's not just going to be the last 10 surahs of the Quran that we keep on reciting over and over again in every salah, right? It should have lengthier recitation of Quran. Number two, prolonged bowing and prostration. The Prophet ﷺ would at times bow down for so long that Aisha radiallahu anha would say that I was unable to recognize which one was longer. The qiyam of salah was longer or the bowing or prostration was longer. SubhanAllah, each pillar of salah was so beautiful. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So inshallah, we can try to optimize on that. And again, how do we do this, subhanAllah? Lengthy recitation of Quran. Again, we think to ourselves, we are not hafaz. We haven't memorized the Quran. How can we do it? And again, subhanAllah, Islam gives us a liyadhi. That yes, in our sunnah prayers, in our voluntary prayers, in our nafil prayers, we can hold the mushaf in our hands during salah. And we can recite as much Quran as we can when we pray, subhanAllah. So we can, inshallah, prolong our recitation of Quran. How can we prolong our bowing and prostration? Again, either we can say subhanAllah Rabbi Al-Azim multiple times during ruku, either we can say subhanAllah Rabbi Al-A'la multiple times in our sujood, or there are recommended du'as of, uh, you know, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he would recite specifically during bowing and prostration. So inshallah, we can make an effort to memorize them and inshallah make it uh, a part of our salah. Number three, understanding the recitation during salah and crying due to it. So the premium package also includes understanding, faham. So it's not just that we're reciting, reciting, but we have no clue as to what we are reciting. So we make an honest effort during the daytime, subhanAllah, to try to understand the Quran in its language and then feel that Quran in our salah. And again, subhanAllah, it's not something difficult. We have already discussed the tips when we uh, covered our session number one, that we can try to memorize the word toward meaning of two lines per day. And inshallah, we can optimize on this. It is definitely very much possible. SubhanAllah, I remember when I was um, doing my Al-Huda course, Talim Al-Quran course um, in 2008, there were subhanAllah so many people who were um, who were sick, who were aged, who were subhanAllah going through difficult life circumstances. And yet subhanAllah, they graduated with me, even though I was 10 years younger than, than them, 30 years younger than them. But subhanAllah, they, they made it, they made it. So if they can do it, subhanAllah, we can do it too. Why not, right? So inshallah, that is one of the methods that we can do inshallah so that we do not leave the essence of Ramadan post-Ramadan. We continue the essence of Ramadan post-Ramadan inshallah. So understanding the recitation during salah and crying due to it. So weeping as we come across ayat that discuss about Jahannam, that discuss about the wrath of Allah and invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from it. And that leads us to the fourth pointer, which is supplementing our Qiyamul Layl with supplications, with a lot of du'as, with a lot of supplications. And this is the package we want to aim for, right? Even though when we talk about Qiyamul Layl, we have two packages, the standard package and the premium package. But this is the package, the premium package that we want to aim for. And when we zoom into the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we notice that after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would pray his Qiyamul Layl, it was his regular custom to walk around the cities of Medina. 
and listen to the recitation of the companions. And it's mentioned that Medina, the city of Medina would be echoing with the recitation of Quran. The houses were alive with Qiyam, subhanAllah. And from this we find that the companions would pray Qiyam layl in a moderate audible voice and they would beautify their recitation. Now, what's the benefit of that? It has two benefits. Number one, you're going to overcome your sleep and enjoy your salah. So that's one benefit. And number two, the angels and the jinns around us, they are going to listen to our recitation and they are going to be our witnesses on the day of Qiyam. And this is something, subhanAllah, we definitely want it. On the day of Qiyamah, we want testimonials for us from the angels, from the jinns, from the people around us, from the Prophet wasallam, that we sent durud upon him, that we emulated his sunnah. So these testimonials will definitely be worth it for us on the day of judgment. And may Allah not make it against us, I mean. So when we talk about the secret code to unlock Jannah, we see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, oh people, spread salam, give food and pray at night when people are sleeping. You will enter Jannah in peace and security. SubhanAllah, once Aisha radiallahu anha, she came home and she mentioned to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that today I heard such a beautiful recitation of Quran that I have never heard before. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, let us both go together and find out who is this person who has such a beautiful recitation of Quran. And SubhanAllah, both the husband and wife the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Aisha Radiallahu Anha, they both leave to listen to this person and they find out that this is Salim, the slave of Hudayfa Radiallahu An, who was performing Qiyamul Layl, who was reciting during the midst of the night. SubhanAllah, do we wish that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam can say this about us? He can witness for us. The angels can listen to our recitation. The jinns around us can listen to our recitation and they witness for us. Yes, we would definitely like that, right? We also notice the special merits of Qiyamul Layl is the fact that this is a time of night when du'as are accepted. So we should optimize on our du'as, on our supplications. Once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out with Abu Bakr Radiallahu An, Umar Radiallahu An, and they came across Ibn Mas'ud Radiallahu An. Now, Abu Bakr Radiallahu An, Umar Radiallahu An, along with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they're behind the scenes and they're listening to the recitation of Ibn Mas'ud Radiallahu An during his qiyam. And Ibn Mas'ud an, is totally unaware. He doesn't even know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is listening to him. And SubhanAllah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, ask, ask whatever you want, Ibn Mas'ud, and you will be given. SubhanAllah. And Ibn Mas'ud an, again, totally unaware of the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is making this du'a for him. He completes his qiyam. And he raises his hands and he says, Ya Allah, I ask you for faith which is not taken away, for blessings that do not expire, and to have the companionship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannatul Khuld, in Jannatul Firdaus. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ameen. And SubhanAllah, the next day in the morning, Umar radiallahu an, he rushes to inform this to Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, that guess what? SubhanAllah, we were there listening to your recitation and the Prophet 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said ameen to your dua. And Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an responded, guess what? Abu Bakr radiallahu an already beat you to it. <laughs> he already informed me this good news, subhanallah, before you came. And Umar radiallahu an said, subhanallah, there is no good deed where Abu Bakr radiallahu an doesn't beat me to it. And that's the legacy of the companions, subhanAllah. They were always trying to excel in terms of good deeds. They were always trying to compete in good deeds. And of course, in that, there is a reflection for us. So okay. let us optimize on this time. Because maybe we are making dua we are supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this time and there is one dua where the angels say ameen for us we never know however one thing to keep in mind is consistency consistency is the key the goal of salatul tahajjud the goal of qiyamul layl is not to do it today and abandon tomorrow. It's like a marathon, not a sprint. So we start off easy, we gain momentum, and we build up along the line. Because remember, the best of deeds are those which are done consistently, no matter how small they are. A man came to Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, and he said, I heard you say that if you commit sins, then Allah prevents you from good things. And he said, I do all sorts of sins that you can think of. And I do not perform much good deeds, but I have a beautiful wife, beautiful children. I have wealth, money. I have all the good. How is it that you say that sins prevent us from good? And Al-Hassan Al-Basri, rahimahullah, one of the renowned scholars of Islam, he responded, do you pray Qiyamul Layl? Do you enjoy your dua? Do you enjoy your salah? This is sufficient prevention that Allah prevented you from communicating with him. SubhanAllah. So let us ponder and reflect. Am I deprived from this fire? Am I deprived from praying Qiyamul Layl? If yes, then what can I do to fix it? Let this Ramadan be an eye opener for us. Let this Ramadan be a transformational Ramadan for us where we are able to reform ourselves in the light of Quran and Sunnah. So let us not deprive ourselves with the nourishment of soul. And one of the key nourishment of soul is Qiyamul Layl. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all and to keep us steadfast on this theme. Ameen ya Rabb. So let us begin our session for today. Inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم. So inshallah we are going to begin from uh, Surah Nuh inshallah and we start at ayah number nine. So in Surah Nuh, we were discussing the fact that Nuh salam, he gave da'wah to the people for 950 years. And he called people night and day. He called people privately and publicly. So he said, I number 10, I said to them, ask forgiveness from your Lord. Verily, he is oft forgiven. SubhanAllah. So that was the legacy of Nuh alayhi salam. We live maybe 40 years, 50 years, max 100 years. And even from those 100 years, if we were to live up to that time, 20 years, 30 years just go and wait, right? Just studying, playing, graduating, 
taking care of our um, relationships, getting married, having children, taking care of them. So almost 25 to 30 years just go in vain. And subhanAllah, the few years that we give da'wah, even that, we do not do night and day, right? We do not do publicly and privately. Sometimes, maybe in the month of Ramadan, we go to our neighbors, we give them gifts, we give them chocolates. Sometimes if there is a community event for, subhanAllah, the new Muslims or the non-Muslims, we invite our neighbors. We attend some interfaith meetings, right? But subhanAllah, Nuh alayhi salam, he gave dawa to his max. And nobody can beat him in this regard. Because number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted him a long life. And number two, he truly maximized his time. He truly optimized his time to call people to Islam, to invite people to Islam. So we ask Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us so what did Nuh alayhi salam say ayah number 10 a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim I said to them, ask forgiveness from your Lord. Verily, he is oft forgiving. He will send rain to you in abundance and give you increase in wealth and children and bestow on you gardens and bestow on you rivers. What is the matter with you, Malakum? That you do not fear Allah and his punishment and you do not hope for the reward? While he has created you in different stages, so this surah, Surah Nuh, teaches us that there are so many virtues and benefits of seeking istighfar besides the fact that we are granted forgiveness. So when we seek istighfar, Nuh alayhi salam tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send rain in abundance to us, which means he's going to grant us ample wealth, children, and he's going to grant us barakah in our ilm, in our amal, in our time. So istighfar is definitely something which the believers stay tuned with. Which the believers keep their tongues moistened with. Because istighfar, seeking tawbah, asking Allah for forgiveness was the custom of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all our righteous predecessors, subhanAllah. And it has worldly and hereafter benefits. So it's a win-win situation. So we shouldn't deprive ourselves from it. And one of the best times to do istighfar is again, the time of the night when everyone is sleeping. Because that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends down to the lower heaven and asks, who is there to ask me so that I can give him? Who is there who seeks forgiveness so that I may forgive him? SubhanAllah. So again, optimizing our time optimizing our tawbah and seeking tawbah as much as we can because it has a lot of benefit. It's mentioned, subhanAllah, that once a man came to Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, and he said, I'm very sinful. Tell me one act that I can do so that Allah can forgive me. He said, go and seek istighfar. Another person came to him and he said, Ya Shaykh, the rain has stopped and there is drought around me. Tell me an action through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can send rain to us. And Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah said, go and do istighfar. Third person came and he said, oh Imam, ya Sheikh, I'm under a lot of debt. Please tell me one action so that I'm able to pay off my debt. Hassan al-Basri, what does he say? Rahimatullah, he says, go and do istighfar. Fourth person comes in and he says, oh, Sheikh, I need offspring. I don't have children. Tell me an action so that I can have children. Tell me something that I can recite, that I can do so that I can have children. And Hassan al-Basri, rahimatullah, said, go seek istighfar. 
And one of his students, the student of Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he's watching all this and he's like, oh my God, so many different people came and he's giving the same solution to all of them. So he goes to his teacher and he says, Ya Imam, how come you gave the solution to all these four people? And Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he responded, recite the ayat 10 to 12 of Surah Nu. Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if a person seeks forgiveness, then Allah will send rain to him in abundance, give increase in his wealth and children, and bestow on him gardens and rivers. SubhanAllah. And that's how the ulama, our mufassirun, our righteous predecessors, that's how they would extrapolate solutions to their problems from the Quran, by the Quran, through the Quran. And subhanAllah, that's what we need to do. Many a times, if we are under stress, we're going through a difficult situation, we should open the Quran, read it. And subhanAllah, we will see that many a times Quran is going to interact with us in ways that we haven't even imagined. So let us take heed inshallah and let us try our best to keep this connection with the Quran even post-Ramadan, even after Ramadan. So that inshallah, we do not let this Wi-Fi connection be weak. We just enhance it more and more every Ramadan and post-Ramadan so that, inshallah, we are able to seek the pleasure of Allah at the time when we pass away. So I number 15, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do you not see how Allah has created the seven heavens one above another? And Allah has made a moon light therein and made the sun a lamp. And Allah has brought you forth from the dust of earth. Afterwards, he will return you into the earth and bring you forth again on the day of resurrection. And Allah has made for you the earth as the wide expanse that you may go about therein in broad roads. Nuh alayhi salam said, my Lord, they have disobeyed me and followed one whose wealth and children give him no increase but loss. And they have plotted a mighty plot. So they started a conspiracy against Nuh alayhi salam. So Nuh alayhi salam is communicating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Ya Rab, this is what my people are doing against me. Behind me, behind the scenes, what should I do? And they have said, you shall not leave your gods, nor shall you leave Wad, nor Suwa, nor Yahud, nor Ya'uq, nor Nasr. And indeed, they have led many astray. Ya Allah, grant no increase to the wrongdoers except in error. So who are these figurines that Nuh alayhi salam is mentioning? Wad, Suwa, Yahud, Ya'uq, and Nasr. They were actually five people who were the most pious people from their community. So these people were so righteous. They would help people. They would um, recite. They would pray. They would be one of the best influential people to preach Islam to people, to teach Islam to people. However, what happened was that when they passed away, when they died, Shaytan whispered to these people that SubhanAllah, these people were amazing people. And what you should do is you should keep their spirit alive. You should not let their spirit fail. And how you would do that is that you should make statues of them and you should keep these figurines in your masajids, in your mosques, so that each time you look at them, you are reminded. You're reminded to do good deeds. It's just like a notification popping up on your phone. And then what happens? SubhanAllah, one generation, they followed this. But when they passed away, the next generation thought, hmm, maybe these statues are actually someone who are intermediaries between us and Allah. So let us worship them. Let us pray to them. And the next generation who came after them, subhanAllah, they lost the entire motif and they started worshiping these statues instead of Allah. And that's how shaitan instilled shirk 
amongst a community who were residing on Tawheed, who were practicing the oneness of Allah and following their prophet, subhanAllah. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Nuh alayhi salam to this nation because they had gone corrupt. They had deviated from the right path. The Prophet وسلم, said, between Nuh and Adam السلام, were 10 generations. All of them were upon the Sharia. Then they differed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets as bringers of good news and as warners. <laughs> SubhanAllah. And that's why we have to be very careful in terms of, SubhanAllah, having statues in our homes or um, you know, putting pictures of saints and people because this is something which is not recommended by the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us that houses in which there are pictures hanging on the walls, the angels do not enter it. So again, subhanAllah, why should we do something that may deprive us from the gathering of angels? from our affiliation with the angels. So inshallah, let us pray and take heed and let us correct ourselves, inshallah. I number 25, because of their sins, they were drowned, then were made to enter the fire and they found none to help them instead of Allah. Nuh alayhi salam said, my Lord, leave not one of the disbelievers on earth. And again, when we look at this du'a, we shouldn't be hasty to uh, make a quick conclusion that how come Nuh alayhi salam is actually making du'a against his people. Let us remember that subhanAllah, this du'a was not just pronounced immediately. He did his part. He preached them for 950 years. Again, it's not 95. There is a zero at the end of this number. So he preached for 950 years. And after a long struggle, when the people kept on persecuting him, oppressing him, harming him, harassing him, that's when he made this dua. If you leave them, they will mislead your slaves, Ya Allah, and they will beget none but wicked disbelievers. Ya Allah, forgive me and my parents and him who enters my home as a believer and all the believing men and women. So again, Nuh alayhi salam is making dua for the believers and he is making dua against the believers because subhanAllah, they went on and on with their persecution and they did not pay heed to the advices of Nuh alayhi salam, to the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what happened? And to the zalimun, the wrongdoers. Ya Allah, grant no increase but the destruction. That's why Nuh alayhi salam eventually made dua against them because these people, they did not value guidance. So that's the conclusion of Surah Nuh. And again, Surah Nuh um, gives us, um, subhanAllah, a highlight, key lesson that when we perform deeds, again, subhanAllah, there are some deeds that are supposed to be done privately. And there are certain deeds that should be done publicly because it actually reaps a lot of benefits. For example, at a fundraiser, subhanAllah, at times we give a hundred bucks, right? We give $200 and we relax and we think that, okay, alhamdulillah, I did well. But then because there is someone out there who gives in a thousand dollars, who gives in $2,000, someone who gets up and they promise to do a price match of the entire amount collected. And what happens, subhanAllah, as we listen to this, we feel humble to ourselves. That subhanAllah, ya Allah, you have Ibad rahman who are so charitable, who are so generous, then why should I stay behind? And that actually gives us a motivation to raise the bar higher. And then looking at them, learning from them, we make a higher pledge. We give even more. Again, it is also applicable when parents, subhanAllah, they are teaching their children. 
they use their own personal examples and they tell their children that subhanAllah, this is how I used to help the poor when I was 12 years old. This is how I used to participate in the volunteer activities in the masjid when I was a youth, when I was a teen. This is how much daily Quran I used to recite. This is how I would respect the elders. Again, this is not bragging. SubhanAllah, this is not bragging because their intention is not to boast. Rather, their intention is to publicize their good deed in order to teach the children. So again, this is permissible because any action, what's the essence of it? In the, in, uh, right? All actions are dependent upon intentions. What are our intentions behind it? So as long as our intention is good, as long as we are seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then inshallah, we will be granted success in dunya and in akhirah. So that's the conclusion of Surah Nuh. And now we have Surah Jinn. And again, subhanAllah, just the the name itself sometimes terrifies us. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the jinns over here, which subhanAllah, which are another different kind of creation who live along with us. SubhanAllah, they do intermingle with us. They are in our houses, but subhanAllah, we do not see them. So just like we are unable to see the angels, just like that, we are unable to see the jinn. There is a barrier between us and them. SubhanAllah. So they see us, but we are unable to see them. Right? SubhanAllah. So this surah is actually going to reveal a time, a specific incident, when the Prophet وسلم, was reciting the Quran and a group of jinns came across this recitation of Quran and they accepted Islam. They accepted Islam. And again, that takes us back to, uh, as we said before, that when we do Qiyamul Layl, when we pray Qiyamul Layl, it's actually recommended to recite in an audible voice, in a moderate voice, so that these angels and jinns can witness our recitation. And you never know, subhanAllah, maybe there are jinns who are non-believers and listening to your recitation, they accept Islam right? SubhanAllah, that would be worth it, right? That would be amazing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us, subhanAllah, to have this opportunity of converting people to Islam, of inviting people to Islam, inshallah. And when we talk about followers, subhanAllah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a lot of followers. It was not just from the humans, it was even amongst the jinns. SubhanAllah. Nowadays, we're impressed by people who have a lot of followers on Facebook or Instagram, right? The more the likes on a video, the more the viewers of a video, we tend to be drawn towards it. Sometimes those videos aren't even authentic, right? And the people aren't even real. They're just playing fake. But nevertheless, we feel so connected to these characters that we just want to be like them. We just want to act like them. We just want to live a life like them, right? But over here, subhanAllah, we see that the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam is a real person. His entire seerah is an authentic story. It is a real story. And he has a lot of likes on his videos. SubhanAllah, not just by the people of the earth, even by the malaika. They're pressing likes. Even the king of all kings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sends salam and peace upon him. And even the jinns, they follow him. They emulate him. And they like him. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has more than a million followers around the globe. From humans and jinns as we know from the surah. And yet many a times we fail to follow our Prophet Sallallahu We fail to emulate him. We are, too we are too lax about the things he loved. We are too lazy to follow his sunnah. We oversimplify the things that he emphasized. 
and we over exaggerate the things that aren't even necessary. Where does the problem lie? The problem lies with us. Same messenger, same message. But a lot of distinction among the followers of the past and the followers now. And if we do a close speculation as to why is there such a huge difference, we realize that there are two types of following. One type of following comes out of burden. And one type of following comes out of pure love. And we should analyze ourselves and answer, what type of follower am I? Which category do I belong? When I pray, when I fast, when I give zakah, when I help people, when I'm kind to my parents, when I'm good to my neighbor, am I doing it out of burden? Or am I doing it in terms of pure love to seek the pleasure of Allah, to follow the beautiful sunnah of the Prophet And indeed, that's the category that we want to aim for. So let us take example from these jinns because indeed they valued the Prophet They heard his message and they accepted it. So inshallah, let us read the message that he came with this Quran and try our best to follow it and emulate the sunnah of the Prophet inshallah. So ayah number one, Surah Jinn. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it has been revealed to me that a group of jinn listened to this Quran. And it's mentioned that they were around three to 10. They said, verily, we have heard a wonderful recitation, a wondrous Quran, Quran al ajaba So what do we learn from here? We learn that jinns are actually able to communicate just like humans. So even though they are supernatural creation, yet they have communities, they talk with each other, they give halaqat to each other, just like us. And amongst the jinns, there are some who are good, who pray, who fast the month of Ramadan. They do everything that we do. And these are the good jinns that do not harm us, even though that they do live with us in our homes, in our gatherings, but they never disturb us. They never harm us. But on the other hand, there are evil jinns as well. Who are they? Shayateen min al jinn. And subhanAllah, we have shayateen min al ins as well, right? And we will see that reference in uh, Surah Nas. So just like we have shayateen from the humans, we have shayateen from the jinns too. And these are the jinns who are obnoxious. These are the jinns who cause corruption. And at times, they disturb humans. They harass humans. How? Via jinn possession. So these jinns, subhanAllah, who are addressed over here, these are the pious jinns. So when they came across the message of Quran, as they were passing by, they heard this recitation of Quran. How did they hear it? Because the Prophet wasallam wasn't reciting the Quran quietly. He wasn't reciting this Quran in his heart. He was reciting it in an audible voice. And again, that's something, inshallah, we should take as a take-home lesson from this Ramadan, from this session, that inshallah, each time. Now on, when I recite the Quran or when I pray Qiyamul Layl, let me, subhanAllah, pray in a way, recite the Quran in a way that is audible. So when these jinns came across this recitation of Quran, they immediately acknowledged that this is indeed Quran and Ajaba. What a beautiful, what a beautiful, wondrous recitation it is. It guides to the right path and we have believed therein and we shall never join in worship anything with our Lord. Meaning before this, they used to commit shirk. But now, after they came across the recitation of Quran, they made a firm resolution that now on, we will never ever commit kufr. We will never commit shirk. And he exalted is, he exalted is the majesty of our Lord. 
has taken neither a wife nor a son nor offspring or children. So they are affirming this fact that indeed our Rabb is the one who needs to be worshipped alone. He cannot have a partner, a wife or children. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the opposite scenario, the flip side of the coin. And the foolish amongst us used to utter against Allah that which was an enormity in falsehood. So the jinns themselves are affirming that within us there are some who are wise, but within us there are some who are foolish, who are deviant, who are corrupt. And the top leader of them is Iblis, Shaitan. And verily, we thought that men and jinn would not utter a lie against Allah. Meaning they are affirming that subhanAllah, how can men and jinn they claim such a heavy word for Allah? How can they commit shirk with Allah? How is this even possible? Why do people do that? Why do the jinns do that? And verily, there were men among mankind who took shelter with the males among the jinn, but they, the jinn, increased them in sin and transgression. And uh, subhanAllah, this actually ayah is referring to the fact that whenever the idol worshippers would go into some deserted places, like the forests or uninhabited places, what they would do is they would seek protection in the jinn. Rather than seeking protection in Allah, they would seek protection in the jinns. That all oh, jinns, whoever is present in this gathering, you know, I seek protection in you. Please do not disturb me. Please do not harass me. And subhanAllah, even just thinking to it, subhanAllah, is, is, it just doesn't make sense. Because why would you seek protection from someone who's already evil? He's not going to help you out. He's going to just, you know, harass you more. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses that. And then in ayah number seven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us, and they thought, as you thought, that Allah will not send any messenger to mankind or jinn. And we have sought to reach the heaven, but found it filled with stern guards and flaming fires. So all this conversation is basically being done by these groups of jinn, by this group of jinn who are saying that before, subhanAllah, we used to go to the heavens and we used to seek information from the angels who were writing other. But subhanAllah, we just recently noticed that our powers suddenly became limited. We were not invincible anymore. We were not able to have full coverage of the heavens. What went wrong? Why did the signal suddenly start to become weak? And then they realized that subhanAllah, it was because of the revelation of Quran, which was being revealed to the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala actually guarded the heaven from these jinns. So the jinns were not able to access the heaven anymore. They were not able to access the information about Qadr anymore. And verily, we used to sit there in stations to steal hearing but any who listens now will find a flaming fire watching him in ambush. So from afterwards, after the Prophet ﷺ started, re uh, started receiving wahi, what would happen is that if someone from amongst the jinns would even make a single attempt to try to steal some information from the angels, to try to have a sneak peek about some information regarding Qadr, a flaming fire would watch and try to catch them in ambush, subhanAllah. So the shooting stars that we see are actually, subhanAllah, these, um, you know, these soldiers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are attacking these jinns, who are trying to seize and grab some information. And we know not whether evil is intended for those on earth or whether their Lord intends for them a right path. So, before, they didn't know why we are unable to access the heavens. Is there some evil going on on the heavens and the earth? Is some corruption going on? Or is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intending some good for us? What's, what's wrong? They didn't realize it. They didn't acknowledge it unless they came to know 
once they heard the recitation of Quran, once they came across the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that, ah, now we know. This is the reason why we were unable to access it. Because a great kalam is being revealed from the heavens and the, to the earth. And of course, when such a weighty kalam is being revealed from the seven heavens to the earth, definitely it is accompanied by many angels. Definitely it is accompanied by so many malaika. And of course, because of that, the space is limited. It is constricted, it is restricted. So they were not able to access the heaven anymore. And the jinns continue their talk, their speech. They say, there are among us some who are righteous and some on the contrary. We are groups having different ways. And this is again a reference that the jinns, they have different religious sects among them. So amongst the jinns, there are Muslim jinns, there are Jews, there are Christians, there are Zoroastrians, there are Hindus. There are, there are all sorts of jinns, followers of different religions. And we think that we cannot escape the punishment of Allah in the earth, nor can we escape him by flight. And indeed, when we heard the guidance, this Quran, we believed therein. And whosoever believes in his Lord shall have no fear either of a decrease in the reward of his good deeds or an increase in the punishment for his sins. Subhanallah. So what did they, um, what did they do after they um, came across this recitation of Quran? They accepted Islam. They accepted the guidance. Subhanallah. And they became Muslims. So again, here we see that just one recitation of Quran was sufficient for their hearts to move. Is our heart like that? Does the recitation of Quran move our hearts? Do my eyes shed tears each time I read the Quran or listen to the Quran? And if not, again, let us take example from these jinns. And of us, some are Muslims, and some of us who are Qasithun, some of us who are deviated from the right path. And whoever has embraced Islam, then such have sought the right path. So again, there is beautiful khutbah. This is a beautiful khutbah being given by the jinns who is successful in terms of success. SubhanAllah, the ones who take this rush, who take the path of guidance and follow it. And as they are following this path, SubhanAllah, they're not just happy for themselves, but they're sad for their peers too who are not following this path, who are deviated from this path. So they say, as for the disbelievers who deviated from the path, right path, they shall be firewood for hell. If they had believed in Allah and went on the right way, we would surely have bestowed on them rain in abundance. So the jinns, they're actually feeling for their peers that if they had followed the path of righteousness, if they had followed the pursuit of forgiveness, seeking tawbah, doing istighfar, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have poured rain in abundance on them. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have poured hidayah on them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have poured the merits, the virtues, and the gifts of dunya on them. And they would have been successful in terms of this world and the hereafter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 17, 17, that we might test them thereby. And whosoever turns away from the reminder of his Lord, he will cause him to enter a severe torment. And the mosques are for Allah. So invoke not anyone along with Allah. So subhanAllah. These jinns, they affirm the path of Islam, they accepted the path of Islam, but whoever from amongst the jinns do not accept this message, they are going to be the fuel of Jahannam. Because Jahannam, again, is an abode for humans and jinns. 
In the same manner, how Jannah is going to be an abode for humans and jinns. And subhanAllah, it's going to be an interesting encounter, inshallah, maybe be from the inhabitants of Jannah. But subhanAllah, when we enter Jannah, we can have this one-on-one -on -one meeting with the jinns as well. SubhanAllah, we can interview them, how they were living around with us. What were they witnessing from amongst their good deeds and from amongst our sins? And SubhanAllah, that would be kind of embarrassing talk if they mentioned to us our sins that they were watching, they were witnessing. But SubhanAllah, because we will be all protected, we are guaranteed Jannah. We will be residing in Jannah. SubhanAllah, that talk will not be uh, depressing anymore. We are going to be in bliss forever and ever. I number 19, and when the slave of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, stood up invoking him in prayer, they, the jinn, just made round him a dense crowd as if sticking one over the other. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I invoke only my Lord and I associate none as partners along with him. Say, it is not in my power to cause you harm or to bring you to the right path. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, none can protect me from the punishment of Allah if I were to disobey him, nor can I find refuge except in him. Mine is but conveyance of the truth from Allah and his messages. And whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then verily for him is the fire of hell. He shall dwell therein forever. Till when they see that which they are promised, then they will know who it is that is weaker concerning helpers and less important concerning numbers. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I know not whether the punishment which you are promised is near or whether my Lord will appoint for it a distant term. He alone is the knower of the unseen and he reveals to none his unseen. And again, the jinns and the angels, they are part of the unseen world, even though we do not see them. Even though we are unaware of them yet, we believe in them. We believe in the fact that they exist. We believe in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is their creator. Except to a messenger from mankind whom he has chosen. And then he makes the band of watching guards, angels, to march before him and behind him. He, Allah, protects them, the messengers, till he sees that the messengers have conveyed the messages of their Lord. And he, Allah, surrounds all that edge with, which is with them. And he is the one who keeps count of all things. Adada. So how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counts everything? Again, we can easily understand this now because subhanAllah, again, just like a Fitbit is able to track our steps, count our steps, definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to monitor all our mistakes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to document all our good deeds and everything is recorded and confirmed by the angels. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from disobeying him and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to actually um, write and document books which are filled with good deeds so that the day when these book of deeds are going to be published on the day of Qiyana, indeed we're going to be happy and pleased to see them and share it with everyone. Insha'Allah. So now we have Surat Muzammil. Again, this is the Makki Surah. And according to the scholars, some say this was the second Surah which was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after Alaq. And some say it was the third in row to be revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So again, a very, very initial Surah which was given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So let us see what was the address of this Surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off this surah by saying, Ya ayyuhal muzammil, O you wrapped in garments, stand to pray all night, half of it, or a little less than that, or a little more, and recite the Quran aloud in a slow, pleasant tone and style. So subhanAllah, when we started up our class, we did discuss the virtues of Qiyamul Layl. And over here we see that this prayer, Qiyamul Layl or Salatul Tahajjud 
was actually a prayer which was incumbent for the Prophet Sallallahu It was farad upon him to pray this salah. Mm -hmm. However, out of the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, it is a voluntary prayer for us. So in these ayat, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to pray and get up and seek the help of Allah. And of course, when we have to get up at night and pray, this demands sacrifice, right? Sacrificing our sleep and sacrificing our rest. So subhanAllah, this is a marathon we are in. We need to give in in order to take. So if you had not sacrificed your sleep, your time, would you have managed to go through this entire um, translation of Quran? Would you have managed to stay awake during the nights of Ramadan, praying Taraweeh, praying Qiyamul Layl? Of course not. SubhanAllah, you were able to accomplish all this because you sacrificed. So definitely when we sacrifice something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are a lot of virtues in it. And the word ratil literally means slow recitation of Quran. So you're exhausted after making iftar. But again, what do you do? You push yourself for taraweeh. Why? Because you tell yourself, this is the final leg of the race. Let me do it now. And then I will rest later. So again, subhanAllah, since we are witnessing the last 10 nights of Ramadan 2021, let us exert ourselves a little extra. Let us push ourselves a little extra, not just within these 10 nights, but after Ramadan as well. Let us sacrifice our time, our energy, our money, fi sabilillah, after Ramadan as well. Because the reward, the trophy that we are going to get, inshallah, on the day of judgment because of this, it is going to be worth it. It will make us forget all the troubles that we went through in dunya, all the sleep deprivation, all the hunger and starvation. Alhamdulillah. So now is the hard work which is required. But on the day of judgment, subhanAllah, it is going to be paid off. It is definitely going to be worth it. So what should we do? Again, subhanAllah, we know from the sunnah of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam that the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam always aimed for the premium package. So Aisha radiallahu anha mentions to us that when the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam would recite some chapters of Quran, he would do tartil in it so much. He would recite them so slowly and so beautifully that sometimes they would become even longer than the chapters they actually were. So imagine subhanAllah, qul huwa Allahu ahad, becoming longer than Surah Mulk. Can we imagine? SubhanAllah. But that's how the recitation of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam was. He would take time. He wouldn't rush, he wouldn't hasten. And again, subhanAllah, now because we are in the grand finale, if you remember, subhanAllah, we discussed during the last 10 nights of Ramadan that each one of us can aim for the six day challenge where we can take a one juz per salah and try to complete the recitation of Quran within six days. SubhanAllah, some of us were able to do it. Some of us were not able to do it because SubhanAllah, we were on our menstrual cycle or because we had young children, regardless of that, SubhanAllah. One thing that we can optimize before we exit Ramadan is to gain the reward of Muqantarin. And how do we gain this? This reward is exclusively for the people who pray Qiyamul Layl. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever prays Qiyam, reciting 10 ayat, will not be recorded as one of the negligent. Whoever prays Qiyam, reciting 100 verses, will be, written, will be recorded as one of the devout. Whoever prays Qiyam, reciting 1,000 verses, will be recorded as one of the muqantareen. And muqantareen actually involves a reward of qintar. And qintar includes an amount of 4,000 dinars, which is a huge amount of wealth. 
So now, how do we calculate these thousand verses? Ibn Hajar rahimahullah mentions to us that Surah Tabarak, just number 29 from the beginning till the end of Quran comprises of 1,000 ayat. So inshallah, subhanAllah, we have very few uh, amount of hours on our hands. Ramadan is almost passing. Ramadan is almost leaving us, but before it passes away, let us hug Ramadan and do something very profound, something very beautiful, and try to aim to earn this Qintar reward. So inshallah, whoever can do it, inshallah, let us make a goal to recite these two juz, juz number 29 and juz number 30 in our Qiyamul Layl, so that inshallah, we can reap the maximum benefit of it. We can optimize our taraweeh, our salah, inshallah, tonight. And inshallah, we are able to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by sacrificing our sleep, our rest. So let us go for it, inshallah. Let us aim for it. And after Ramadan is over, subhanallah, we can still try to aim even if this reward is not possible, if this seems like a higher goal, we can still aim to recite 100 ayat in our Qiyamul Layl. It can be within two rakah, it can be within eight rakah, up to us, inshallah. We can hold our mushaf, we can recite. If we just recite Surah Baqiyah, which comprises of 86 ayat, then along with that, subhanAllah, if we um, do Surah Naba in the next, uh, next rakah, Alhamdulillah, all together, it actually exceeds more than 100 ayah. So it doesn't take long, maximum of like 15, 20 minutes. So even after Ramadan leaves, inshallah, we can still try to aim for reciting 100 ayah during our Qiyamul Layl every single night. If not, then once a week. If not, then once a month. But this is something we should do it because consistency is a key. Even if we do little, it's better to be consistent. It's better to stay consistent, inshallah. Ayah number five, verily we shall, down, we shall send down to you a weighty word. And why is this a heavy kalam? Why is this a weighty word? Asma radiallahu anha tells us that when Surat Ma'ida was revealed upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was sitting on a camel and she happened to hold the rope of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's camel. And she said the pressure was so much due to the wahi which was being revealed to him, I felt that the front leg of the camel was almost about to collapse. It was almost about to break. Zayd bin Thabit radiallahu an, he said, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was receiving wahi, he would shiver and Pearls of sweat would come trickling down his side of face. SubhanAllah. So definitely this is a very heavy word. This, <coughs> excuse me. Definitely this is a very heavy kalam, but the fact that the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam endured all this heaviness, he endured all this hardship, this weight was for who? It was for you and me. It was for all of us. So shouldn't we be grateful and thankful? Shouldn't we recite this kalam and thank Allah and emulate our Prophet Sallallahu because he was known to be a walking, talking Quran. Ayah number six, verily, the rising by night is very hard and most potent and good for governing oneself and most suitable for understanding the word of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning this to us? That indeed, when we stand up at night and we pray and we recite, it's actually good for understanding. It's actually good for our memory. And subhanAllah, now even science, now even research backs this up because there is so many, <coughs> excuse me, there are so many studies that prove that meditation improves our brain tune, our brain function. 
it tunes and reduces markers of brain degeneration and it improves both working memory and long-term memory. And meditating with punctuality is proven to cause long-term changes in the brain, uh, including increasing brain plasticity, which keeps it healthy, which keeps it healthy, plus the fact that you are able to understand faster, you're able to memorize faster because of the quiet environment that you have around you. And that's why, subhanAllah, the time of the Hajjah, the last third of night, actually is recommended for Hufaz to memorize the Quran. It's actually a good time, even for academics in terms of learning, to excel. So this is something which was mentioned to us 1400 years ago, but SubhanAllah, now we know that even science has proven this to be true. Verily, this is for you by day prolonged occupation with ordinary duties. I number eight, Surat Muzammil, and remember the name of your Lord and devote yourself to him with a complete devotion. He alone is the Lord of the East and the West. La ilaha illahu. None has the right to be worshipped but he. So take him alone as a disposer of your affairs and be patient with what they say and keep away from them a good word. So again, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning this to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Because again, the surah was revealed in Mecca. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was going through a lot. SubhanAllah, he was defamed with all sorts of name calling and nicknames and subhanAllah, a lot of oppression. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him to do what? Waspir. Be patient. Whatever they say. Refrain. Ignore them. And leave me alone to deal with the deniers, those who are in possession of the things of life, and give them respite for a little while. Verily, with us are fetters to bind them in a raging fire, and a food that chokes, and a painful torment. On the day when the earth and the mountains will be in violent shaking, and the mountains will be a heap of sand poured out. Verily, we have sent to you, O man, a messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to be a witness over you, as we did send a messenger to Musa. As we, sent, uh, as we did send a messenger, Musa alayhi salam, to Fir'aun. But Fir'aun disobeyed the messenger. So we seized him with a severe punishment. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning this to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to comfort his heart because he was going through a lot. And of course, these stories of the prophets are a comfort and a consolation for all of us who are going through a lot who are meeting a lot of challenges, whether, whether it be at home or at work or at school. These stories are a source of guidance and consolation for us. Then how can you avoid the punishment if you disbelieve on a day that will make the children gray-headed? Where on the heaven will be cleft asunder, his promise is certainly to be accomplished. Verily, this is an admonition. Therefore, whosoever wills, let him take a path of his Lord. Verily, your Lord knows that you do stand to pray at night, a little less than two thirds of the night, or half the night, or a third of the night, and also a party of those with you. And Allah measures the night and the day. He knows that you are unable to pray the whole night. So he has turned to you in mercy. So recite of the Quran as much as may be easy for you. He knows that there will be some amongst you who are sick, others who are traveling through the land seeking the bounty of Allah, yet others who are fighting in the cause of Allah. So recite as much of the Quran as is easy for you and perform salah and give zakah and lend to Allah a good loan. And whatever good you send before you is for your own selves. You will certainly find it with Allah better and greater in reward. And seek forgiveness of Allah. Wastafirullah. Inna Allah ghafoorur rahim. Verily, Allah is oft forgiving and most merciful. So that's the conclusion of Surah Muzammil, insha'Allah. So let us now begin with Surah Muddathir.
Again, this is a Makki Surah, and some of the scholars, they say that this was revealed as third revelation after Muzammil, and some people say that it was actually revealed as the second revelation before Surah Muzammil was revealed. So let us see what are the commandments in it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, O you, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, enveloped in garments, arise and warm. Meaning now that you have received this gift of Quran, what should you do? What should be your next mission? Get up and warn. Tell people, teach them, preach them, and invite them to Islam. And again, this is a commandment for all of us as well. SubhanAllah, now that we have acquainted ourselves with Quran, affiliated ourselves with the Quran, what should we do? Just keep it to ourselves? No. We should share it with our family members. We should share it with our children, with our relatives. Take one student, inshallah, and try to teach her the lessons that you learned, that you made notes of. And if you have any question, ask the people of knowledge. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, the best among you is he who learns and teaches the Quran. So inshallah, for a lifelong till our breath, till our last breath, we want to be the students of Quran and teachers of Quran, inshallah, in whatever shape or form we can do. So if we do not feel qualified enough to teach tafsir, we can share our notes with them. If subhanAllah, we're not even good in making notes, inshallah, we can ask them to recite their word to word recitation, word to word translation of Quran to you. So you memorize and recite to them, and then they memorize and they recite to you. Because the venues are multiple, the opportunities are many. We have to seek it out and inshallah, try our best to optimize. Ayah number three, and magnify your Lord and purify your garments and keep away from a rich, from the idols. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions purifying our garments. And now we see that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very particular about his hygiene, about his clothing, about cleanliness, about purity. So definitely internal and external purity is required. And give not a thing in order to have more and be patient for the sake of your Lord. And from this, we learned that not just external purity is required, internal purity is required too. So when we give someone a gift, we shouldn't give it for the sake of receiving more. That, okay, I'm going to invite her to my house so that she invites me next time. I'm going to give her an Eid gift so that she gives me a better Eid gift. No, when we gift someone, when we share something with someone, when we invite someone, all these days are supposed to be done only to seek the pleasure of Allah, not to expect any worldly gains. SubhanAllah. So internal purity is part of Islam. It's part of our excellence in being. Because that's what defines us and it keeps us away from evil thoughts, from toxic thoughts. And of course, in order to stay away from all those toxic thoughts, we have to be patient. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I number eight, Surat Muddathir, then when the trumpet is sounded, truly the day will be a hard day, far from easy for the disbelievers. Leave me alone to deal with whom I created lonely without any wealth or children. And then granted him resources in abundance and children to be by his side. And subhanAllah, the Mufassirun, they tell us that these ayat are actually referring to um, the father of Khalid bin Walid. Khalid bin Walid radiallahu an, was a person who accepted Islam. So he is one of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, his father, Walid bin Mughira, he did not accept Islam. He was a staunch opponent of the Prophet ﷺ. He was against Islam and he tried everything to harm Islam and the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So Allah says, leave me alone to deal with him. The one who was granted resources and children and made life smooth and comfortable for him. 
after all that he desires that I should give more? So what was his, um, subhanAllah, what was his purpose of life? To earn more. And subhanAllah, that's the ultimate desire of any multimillionaire, right? That the more money they have, the more they require, the more they want to earn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this was his desire too. So no, verily, he has been opposing our ayat. I shall oblige him to climb a slippery mountain in Jahannam and face a severe torment. Verily, he thought and plotted. So let him be cursed how he plotted. So he knew, subhanAllah, that Quran was indeed the kalam of Allah. But just to secure his position as a chief of his people, to be the elite of the community, what did he do? He opposed the Prophet وسلم, and he started a conspiracy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala vividly describes the scene over here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sketches it in great detail how he thought, how he plotted, how he planned against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and once more, let him be cursed how he plotted. Then he thought, then he frowned, and he looked in a bad tempered way. Then he turned back and he was proud. Then he said, this is nothing but magic from that of old. This is nothing but the word of a human being. I will cast him into Jahannam. And what will make you know exactly what Jahannam is. It spares not any sinner, nor does it leave anything unburnt, burning and blackening the skins. Over it are 19 angels as guardians. And we have set none of that angels as guardians of the fire, and we have fixed their number as 19, only as a trial for the disbelievers. In order that the people of the scripture may arrive at a certainty, and that the believers may increase in faith, and that no doubt may be left for the people of the scripture and the believers, and that those in whose hearts is a disease of hypocrisy, and the disbelievers may say what Allah intends by this curious example. Thus Allah leads astray whom he wills and guides whom he wills, and none knows the hosts of your Lord but he. And this Jahannam is nothing else than a warning reminder to mankind. So when this ayah was revealed, subhanAllah, the disbelievers, they started mocking the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam by saying that how come there's so many people from the time of Adam Alayhi Salam till the day of judgment who are going to be sent to Jahannam, who are going to be punished and thrown in Jahannam, but there are only 19 angels to guard it? Seriously, just 19? To manage such a big, huge population? How can just 19 people, 19 angels, give punishment to so many criminals? How is this possible? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this number is indeed a trial for them to accept. Because subhanAllah, the angels, they are not a creation like us. They are huge. They are magnificent in the size, in terms of size. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that for, the, for some, like for the hypocrites, this number is a trial. It increases them in their hypocrisy. It enables them to harden their hearts. However, for the believers, it only increases them in faith. I number 32, no, and by the moon, and by the night when it withdraws, and by the night when it brightens, verily it is but one of the greatest signs. A warning of mankind, to mankind, to any of you that chooses to go forward or to remain behind. Every person is a pledge for what he has earned, except those on the right hand. Illa ashab al -yameen. In gardens, they will ask one another. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to include part of speech over here. A conversation will be mentioned. And this conversation is basically taking place between the inhabitants of Jannah and Nar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. I number 41, about the criminals, they will say to them, who will say the Ashab al yameen will say to the criminals, what has caused you to enter hell? 
they will say, we were not of those who used to offer salah, nor we used to feed the miskeen, and we used to talk falsehood with the vain talkers, and we used to the deny the day of recompense until there came to us death, that is certain. And again, this is painful because this teaches us that the people of Jannah will have access to the people of Jahannam. They will be able to communicate with the people of Jahannam. How would that be possible? Wallahu alam. It is from the knowledge of Al-Ghaib, but it will definitely be possible. So when the people of Jannah are going to ask them, how did you end up in hellfire? What would pe the people say? Number one, we did not pray salah. We felt salah was a burden. And again, this teaches us the importance of salah, that we cannot miss salah, whether it is for shopping or whether we're going on a vacation, we cannot miss salah. What else do these people say? We did not feed the needy. And generally speaking, when we're full stomach, we forget the hunger of the poor. SubhanAllah, due to this COVID, there's so many people who are jobless. In so many countries, people, Muslims, are actually committing suicide due to extreme hunger and thirst. SubhanAllah. So, what did these people do? They never fed the miskeen. They were unaware of their needs. They did nothing to quench their thirst. And again, and this is a lesson for us that we should help the needy. We should feed the needy and we should think about them and make dua for them. And we should help them with any kind of monetary benefits that we can. And we used to talk falsehood with vain talkers. That's another reason, meaning they would indulge in useless discussions. Useless discussion, which has no benefit in it. Again, we have to be careful. SubhanAllah, so much time we waste talking about celebrities, learning about their lives. Again, what is benefit? in learning about them? What is the benefit in passing information about them? And what else did these people do? The people of Jahannam, they denied the day of recompense. And part of denial is also not preparing for it. So as believers, we know that as soon as we die, as soon as we see the angel of death, that's it. It is day of resurrection for us because we will not have any more opportunities to do good deeds. So subhanAllah, we don't have to wait that, okay, Isa alayhi salam will come, Yajuj and Majuj will come, the Jal will come, and then the day of judgment will come. SubhanAllah, no. The moment we see Malikul Maut, time is up. Time's up. So we better prepare for our Aqira before it's too late. Before it's too late. May Allah guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us steadfast on this thing. I mean, I number 48, so no intercession of intercessors will be of any use to them. Then what is wrong with them? That they turn away from receiving admonition. And again, imagine, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to convey to who to convey to us. Famayahum. Rhetorical question. How come? Why? What's wrong with them? That they are turning away. They are doing i'rad from this zikr, from this admonishment. May Allah forgive us because there's so many times when we ignore this Quran, we neglect this Quran, we take it as a burden. We feel that it's too boring. We feel it's too outdated. Astaghfirullah. This kalam is for all times. This kalam is for all ages. And this kalam has the solution to all our problems. If we read it, if we abide by it. May Allah guide us. I number 50, as if they were frightened wild donkeys, fleeing from a hunter or a lion or a beast of prey. No, every one of them desires that he should be given pages spread out. No, but they fear not the hereafter. No, verily, this Quran is an admonition. Indeed, in Nahu 
So whoever wills, let him read it and receive admonition from it. And they will not receive admonition unless Allah wills. He, Allah, is the one deserving that mankind should be afraid of him and should be dutiful to him and should not take any ilah along with him. And he is the one who forgives sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us his maqfirah so that we are included amongst the people who are ahl al-maqfirah. Amin ya Rabbi. So that's the conclusion of Surah Muddathir. And now we have Surah Qiyana. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the surah by saying, La uqasimu bi yawmil qiyana. I swear by the day of resurrection. And I swear by the self-reproaching person, a believer, nafsul lawama. Does man, a disbeliever, think that we shall not assemble his bones? Yes, we are able to put together in perfect order the tips of his fingers. SubhanAllah. This is something that Quran is telling about 1400 years ago. Quran is mentioning about this. But SubhanAllah, recently, just a few years ago, SubhanAllah, a few hundred years ago, in 1880, fingerprinting became the scientific method of identification. SubhanAllah, no, per, no people can have the exact same fingerprints. No two people can have that. Not even identical twins. And that's the reason why it is used worldwide for purposes of identification. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says on the day of judgment, we are even able to produce their fingerprints back again. SubhanAllah. So there is this method, scientific method available for identification in dunya, then definitely the method of identification of the hereafter is much advanced, much stronger than this. I number five, no, man denies resurrection. So he desires to continue committing sins. He asks, when will be this day of resurrection? So when the sight shall be dazed and the moon will be eclipsed and the sun and moon will be joined together. On that day, man will say, where is the refuge to flee? No, there is no refuge. Unto your Lord will be the place of rest that day. On that day, man will be informed of what he sent forward and what he left behind. No, man will be a witness against himself. His body parts will speak up. Though he may put forward his excuses to cover his evil deeds. Move not your tongue concerning the Quran, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to make haste therein. It is for us to collect it and to give you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the ability to recite it. So what would happen is that when Jibreel alayhi salam used to bring the revelation to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would recite it in hastiness, quickly, so that he can memorize it better. So he's told not to recite this Quran in a rush. Because this is a kalam which should be recited with ease, with beauty. And again, in it is a lesson for us too. That we should try our best to be proficient in recitation. And if not, we should try to at least improve our recitation. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said, the one who is proficient in the recitation of Quran will be with the honorable, honorable angels. And he who recites the Quran and finds it difficult to recite, doing the best to recite it in the best way possible. So he's trying, he's struggling, yet he's unable to recite it beautifully, correctly, with the correct tajweed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he will have a double reward. SubhanAllah. So both way, it's a win-win situation, but what matters is trying, striving, struggling. And Allah sees our efforts and awards us accordingly. I number 18, and when we have recited it to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through Jibreel, then follow it, this Quran, in terms of its recitation. Then it is for us, Allah, to make it clear to you, not as you think, will not not as you think that you mankind will not be resurrected and recompensed for your deeds, but you men love the present life of this world and neglect the hereafter. Some faces that day shall be nadira, shining and radiant. 
looking at their Lord Allah. SubhanAllah. So we, inshallah, if we are able to enter Jannah, then the bliss of Jannah, one of the most pleasurable things of Jannah is going to be looking at our Rabb, looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when the companions were told about this, subhanAllah, they were amazed that how can we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How is it even possible? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, are you harmed by seeing the sun and the moon when there are no clouds beneath them? Just like that, you will surely see your Lord. Similar to that, subhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to be the recipients to see him, to have a glimpse of him, and to be in his company, to be in the companionship of the ones whom he loves, the companionship of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and other prophets and the companions and the shuhada and the siddiqeen and the salihin. Amin ya Rabb. And some faces that day will be basira, dark and gloomy thinking that some calamity is about to fall on them. May Allah protect us from being the people who will have darkened faces. I number 26, know when the soul reaches to the collarbone and it will be said, who can cure him and protect him from death? And he, the dying person will conclude, it was the time of parting and one leg will be joined with another leg. The drive will be on that day to your Rabb. And subhanAllah, these ayah are specifically mentioning about the time of death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kalla idha balagati taraqi wa qila man raq wa zanna annahu al-firaq wa taffati al-saqu bil-saq and what happens to us immediately after death? SubhanAllah, as soon as we die, our respiration and blood circulation cease. It ceases. In the first hour, our body muscles, they start to relax. Our eyelids, they lose their tension. Our pupils, they dilate. Our jaw might fall open and our skin starts to sag. Eyelids are amongst the first muscles to stiffen. And subhanAllah, that's why the Prophet Sallallahu instructed us to close the eyelids of a deceased person as soon as he passes away. And following that, what happens? Our body temperature starts to drop with a linear progression. Approximately in the third hour after our death, Chemical changes within our body cells will cause our muscles to stiffen. One week after death, our skin will blister and a slightest touch can cause it to fall off. A month after death, our hair, nails, and teeth will fall out and eventually we will become fossils. Of course, this information will vary based upon a person's age, weight, how his death took place, and other environmental factors. But just a food for thought. The body that we have now, we take care of it so much throughout our lives by feeding it, cleaning it, grooming it. However, once we die, we will decompose. Our beauty shall fade away. Our wealth shall dwindle amongst others. Our merits and certificates shall all stay behind. However, what shall remain? Our deeds. They will not decompose. They will stay with us throughout our hereafter, throughout our journey to the day of judgment. So let us carefully look at our amal. Just like our physical bodies need cleansing and grooming, our hearts require washing away the stains of sins as well. So let us repent now, because that is an essential key to a happy, successful hereafter life. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ayah number 31. So he neither believed in this Quran, nor did he pray. But on the contrary, he denied and he turned away. Then he walked in conceit to his family, admiring himself. Woe to you, and then again, woe to you. Again, woe to you, and then again, woe to you. Does man think that he will be left neglected? Was he not a mixed drop of male and female discharge emitted poured forth? Then he became a clot. Then Allah shaped and fashioned him in due proportion and made of him into two genders, male and female. Is not he, Allah, able to give life to the dead? Yes, he is able to do all that. So a very, um, subhanAllah, profound surah, Surah Qiyamah, reminds us about the day of Qiyamah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to be prepared for that day when there will be no second chances. And the only thing that will help us, inshallah, are going to be our deeds, our amal, and the mercy of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of us. Amen. So now we have Surat Insan. And Surat Insan, subhanAllah, again, it is also known with another name. It is known as Surat Dahar. And Dahar literally means time. So let us see what does this surah has, subhanAllah, in store for us. A lot of lessons, a lot of description about Jannah and Jahannam. I number one, rajim. has there not been over man a period of time when he was not a thing worth mentioning? Verily, we have created man from a nutta, mixed drop of discharge, in order to test him so that we made him hearer and seer. Verily, we showed him the way, whether he is grateful or ungrateful, meaning to every aspect there are two ways. Are we grateful or ungrateful? Verily, we have prepared for the disbelievers iron chains, iron collars, and a blazing fire. Verily, the pious shall drink of a cup of wine mixed with water from a spring in paradise called Kafur. SubhanAllah, imagine camphor mixed with water, the purity, SubhanAllah, and the fragrance of which would resemble camphor. The wine which is served to us, inshallah, which is going to be served to us, is going to be mixed with this, with kafur, subhanAllah. So imagine how would it be, subhanAllah, how amazing, delicious, and beautiful it would be just to smell the fragrance of it and then to drink it. Allahumma ja'alna minha. May Allah include us amongst the recipients of this gift. A spring thereof the slaves of Allah will drink, causing it to gush forth abundantly. They are those who fulfill their promises and they fear a day whose evil will be wide spreading. And they give food in spite of their love for it to the miskeen, the orphan and the captive, saying, we feed you seeking the countenance of Allah only. We wish for no reward nor thanks from you. So these people, subhanAllah, they indulge in secret worship. They do their good deeds to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So once they feed the miskeen, what do they say? We feed you seeking the countenance of Allah only. And we do not wish for any reward nor thanks from anyone. And again, that's the motto we should follow as well. That when we help someone, when we gift someone, we should not wait for a thank you note. We should not wait for a jazakallah khairan. Rather, we should expect the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because ultimately that is the best reward. Verily, we fear from our Lord a day which is hard and distressful. That will make the faces look horrible. So Allah saved them from the evil of that day and gave them a light of beauty and joy. And their recompense shall be Jannah and silken garments because they were patient. Reclining therein on raised thrones, they will see there neither the excessive heat of the sun nor the excessive bitter cold. And the shade thereof is clothed upon them. And the bunches of fruits thereof will hang low within their reach. SubhanAllah. So in Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that there will be no darkness. 
subhanallah, no gloomy and dark weather, no weather issues, subhanallah. And we may wonder that how long is the day of Jannah going to be, subhanallah, because we realize that there is no sleeping and waking up, right? We're going to be awake all the time, enjoying ourselves, adorning and beautifying ourselves. So Allah subhanahu mentions to us that there's going to be a beam of light, which is going to be emitted from the throne of the Jannah. And that is going to be, subhanallah, the lighting system of Jannah. So it's going to be calm, it's going to be peaceful, and the light is going to be just right. Not too much to hurt our eyes and not too less to cause us depression. And then Allah subhanahu ta'ala mentions to us that not just the environment is going to be beautiful, even subhanAllah, the food that we're going to be given, that is going to be delicious. As soon as we wish for something, it's just gonna come to us. It's gonna be within our reach. And amongst them will be passed round vessels of silver and cups of crystal. Crystal clear made of silver, they will determine the measure thereof according to their wishes. And again, subhanAllah is beautiful that Allah subhanAllah says that when they're given drinks in Jannah, it's going to be qaddaruha taqdira. The drink will exactly be how much we desire to drink. Because in dunya, sometimes you request a drink at a restaurant or maybe at a gathering, and the host brings too much. And subhanAllah, you're like, I didn't ask for that much. I just wanted little, just, you know, a small amount. But in Jannah, subhanAllah, you are going to be given the exact amount of quantity that you desire. And they will be given to drink there of a cup of wine mixed, mixed with zanjabil, with ginger. For those of us, subhanAllah, who like ginger ale in dunya, subhanAllah, we will be excited to taste the Jannah version of ginger ale, inshallah. And a spring therein called salsabil, and round about them will serve boys of everlasting youth. If you see them, you would think them as scattered curls. And subhanAllah, Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu and he said that the person in the lowest level of Jannah, he will be given 1,000 slaves who will attend to him, who will take care of him, subhanAllah. So imagine if that's the case for the lowest level of Jannah, imagine the people who are sabiqun al who are the elites of Jannah. And when you look there in Jannah, you will see a delight any great dominion. Upon them will be green garments of fine and thick silk. They will be adorned with bracelets of silver and their Lord will give them a pure drink. And it will be said to them, verily, this is a reward for you and your endeavor has been accepted. SubhanAllah. Just imagine the day on the day of resurrection, when you're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us that your Ramadan, your Quran, your Salah, your Zakah, everything has been accepted. Everything has been recorded. And you are going to be rewarded for it. SubhanAllah. It's definitely going to be one of the most happy moments in our life blissful moments of our life to listen this right from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ja'ala minhum ameen. Verily, it is we who have sent down the Quran to you by stages. Therefore, be patient with constancy to the command of your Lord and obey neither a sinner nor a disbeliever among them. And remember the name of your Lord every morning and afternoon. And during the night, prostrate yourself to him and glorify him a night long through. Verily, these disbelievers, they love the present life of this world and they put behind them a heavy day, the day of judgment. It is we who created them and we have made them of strong build. And when we will, we, we can replace them with others like them with a complete replacement. Verily, this is an admonition. So whoever wills, let him take a path to his Lord. But you cannot will unless Allah wills. Verily, Allah is ever all-knowing and all-wise. 
He will admit to his mercy whom he wills. And as for the wrongdoers, he has prepared a painful torment. So that's the conclusion of Surah Insan. It is mentioned that it was the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, to recite Surah Insan during the Fajr Salah of Salatul Jummah. So in the first rak'ah, just like we said before, the Prophet وسلم, would recite Surah Sajda. And in the second rak'ah of Salatul Jummah during Fajr, he would recite this Surah, Surah Dahar. So again, a motivation for us, an added motivation to memorize this Surah and inshallah recite it in our Salah in order to follow his Sunnah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now we have Surah Mursalat. And this is also a Makki Surah. So let us see, inshallah, ayah number one, Surah Mursalat, one Mursalati Urfa. By the winds sent forth one after another. And by the winds that blow violently, and by the winds that scatter clouds and rain, and by the ayat that separate right from wrong, and by the angels that bring the revelations to the messengers to cut off all excuses or to warn, Surely what you are promised must come to pass, meaning the day of judgment. Then when the stars lose their light, and when the heaven is clapped asunder, and when the mountains are blown away, and when the messengers are gathered to their time appointed, meaning the messengers are going to be called in to give testimony for their people or against their people. For what day are these signs postponed? For the day of sorting out. Sorting who? The men of Jannah and the men of Jahannam. That's the distinction which is going to be on that day amongst humans and jinns. And what will explain to you what is the day of sorting out? Yawmul Fasl. Woe that day to the deniers. Did we not destroy the ancient people of old? So shall we make later generations to follow them? Thus do we deal with the criminals. Woe that day to the deniers. Did we not create you from a despised semen? Then we placed it in a place of safety womb for a known period determined by gestation. So we did measure and we are the best to measure. Woe that day to the deniers. So we see in the surah that the oft-repeated theme again and again is that the people who denied the day of resurrection, they are going to be regretful on the day of Qiyamah. Have we not made the earth a receptacle for the living and the dead? And have placed therein firm and tall mountains and have given you to drink sweet water? Woe that day to the deniers. It will be said, depart you to that which you used to deny. Depart you to a shadow of hellfire in three columns, neither shade nor of any use against the fierce flame of the fire. Verily, Jahannam throws sparks huge as a fort. And again, imagine the tall towers, the fortresses. If that seems so tall, so huge for us in dunya, imagine the fire of Jahannam. It is going to be much magnificent and bigger than any tower of this dunya. It is going to be like Qasr, a fort. As if they were yellow camels, woe that day to the deniers. That will be a day when they shall not speak and they will not be permitted to put forth any excuse. Woe that day to the deniers. That will be a day of decision. We have brought you and the men of old together. So if you have a plot, use it against me. Woe that day to the deniers. Verily the pious shall be in the midst of shades and springs. And fruits such as they desire, eat and drink comfortably for that which you used to do. Verily, thus we reward the people who do good. Woe that day to the deniers. O you disbelievers, eat and enjoy yourselves in the worldly life for a little while. Verily, you are criminals. Woe that day to the deniers of the day of resurrection. And then it is said to them, bow down to your to your Rabb in prayer. They do not bow down and offer prayers. 
more than day to the deniers. Then in what statement after this, the Quran, will they believe? Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if they do not listen to this Quran, then what else will they listen to? What else are they waiting for? So again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes this surah with a rhetorical question. And again, this is a reminder for us that if we are slacking off in terms of our salah, let us take heed, let us bow down, let us supplement ourselves, our ruh, with the recitation of Quran. So that, inshallah, on the day of judgment, we are not the ones to be the recipients of this vaid. We are not from the ones who are mukaddibin. Insha'Allah. So that's the conclusion of just number 29. And now we have just number 30, Surah Naba, ayah number one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the surah by saying, Anna yatasa'alun. What are they asking one another about? About the great news, meaning about the day of judgment, because the people are curious to know about it. What is this day of judgment about? How is it going to be like? about which they are in disagreement. No, they will come to know. No, again, they will come to know. Have we not made the earth as a bed and the mountains as pegs? And we have created you in pairs, male and female, and we have made your sleep as a thing for rest. And we have made the night as a covering through its darkness. And we have made the day for livelihood. And again, all these are subhanAllah beautiful blessings because if we just had day, then subhanAllah we would never have rest. Plus night is actually a covering for us. Whether it is in terms of having marital relationship, it is a cover for the husband and wife, or it is a cover for all of us to be in isolation when we interact with our Rabb in our nightly prayers. When we communicate with our Rabb through a recitation of Quran. SubhanAllah. So indeed, there is a blessing in the night and there is a blessing in the day. And we have built above you seven strong heavens. And we have made therein a shining lamp, the sun. And we have sent down from the rainy clouds abundant water that we may produce therewith corn and vegetation and gardens of thick growth. Verily, the day of decision is a fixed time. SubhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions all these blessings to us just to highlight one thing, which is naba, the news, the great news. What is the great news? The day of judgment. That yes, all these blessings are there for you to use and enjoy, yet, all this dunya needs to be sought in order to seek the ultimate mission, the ultimate accomplishment, which is to seek the riva of Allah, the pleasure of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The day when the trumpet will be blown, you shall come forth in crowds, groups, and groups. And the heaven shall be opened, and it will become as gates, and the mountains shall be moved away from their places. And they will be as if they were a mirage. Truly, Jahannam is a place of ambush, a dwelling place for those who transgress. They will abide therein for ages. Nothing cool shall they taste therein, nor any drink. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that Jahannam is actually like a mirsad. It is like it is like a trap which is going to surprise the deniers of it, the, the disbelievers, and all the people who were criminals, who were not preparing for it. And how it is going to be, they will abide therein for ages. And ahqab literally means successive periods of long time, appearing one after another not for a second or a day, but for a long time. So these people are not just going to be there in Jahannam for a day, for a second, for a month, but it's going to be for a long time. May Allah protect us all. 
nothing cool shall they taste therein, nor any drink except the boiling water and dirty wound discharge. This is an exact recompense. For verily, they used to not look for reckoning, meaning they never prepared for it. But they denied our ayat completely. And all things we have recorded in a book. Everything that we do. Mistakes, the, the way we slap off in our ibadat, the way we do when we harm people in terms of our relationships the way we have mishaps in terms of our dealings, everything is recorded. So taste the results of your evil actions. No increase shall we give you except in torment. Verily, for the muttaqeen, there is nafaza, there is success. Gardens and vineyards and young maidens of equal age and a full cup of wine. No love, dirty talk, shall they hear therein, nor lying. SubhanAllah. So the believers, the pious people, because they refrain from evil talk, dirty talk, toxic friendships, they refrain from it in dunya. They avoided all those posts and tweets and they stayed away from it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward them by living in a place which is free of all sorts of filth, dirty thoughts, and dirty actions, evil thoughts, and toxic friendships. They're going to have purity all around them. There will be no love. And again, what a beautiful atmosphere would that be? This is a reward from your Lord, jaza'an min rabbika, ata'an hisaba, an ample calculated gift. Meaning this is a very generous gift, not even an inch or pint equal to the amount of good deeds that we do. SubhanAllah, because we all know how deficient we are in terms of our good deeds. So this is jaza'an min rabbik, ata'an hisaba, a very generous reward. This is, a, this is a reward from the Lord of the heavens and the earth and whatsoever is between them, the most gracious with whom they cannot dare to speak on the day of resurrection. And the day that Aruh, Jibreel alayhi salam, and the angels will stand forth in rows, they will not speak except him whom the most gracious allows and he will speak what is right. That is because, without a doubt, that is a true day. So whoever wills, let him seek a place with a way to his Lord by obeying him. Verily, we have warned you of a near torment, the day when man will see the deeds which his hands have sent forth. And the disbeliever will say, I wish I would have been dust. So that is the conclusion of Surat Naba, and now we have Surat Nadi'at. Again, this is a Makki Surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, ayah number one. Wa By those angels who pull out with the great violence, meaning they extract the soul of disbeliever. And the ahadith mentioned to us that when the soul is extracted from a disbeliever, it is as if it is a wet ball of wool, which is struck in thorny bushes and it's pulled out. That's how painful it is for a disbeliever. Then his ruh is taken away. <laughs> By those angels who gently take out. And for the believer, we know that a person who followed Islam, who emulated the Prophet وسلم, he lived by Islam, then for them when he passes away, his soul comes out as easily, just like a water drops from the jug into a glass. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. May we be, subhanAllah, the recipients of this reward that our ruh is taken out so easily. And by those that swim along, who move fast, meaning the angels, they do move very fast. And by those that press forward as in a race, 
So they race, they rush in terms of carrying the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, carrying out the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by those angels who arrange to do the commands of their Lord, meaning they obey, they're not like us, they do not slack off. As soon as a commandment is given to them, they immediately rush to fulfill it. On the day when the first blowing of the trumpet is blown, the earth and the mountains will shake violently. The second blowing of the trumpet follows it. Some hearts that day will shake with fear and anxiety. And again, if we have ever experienced anxiety in our life, just double it, triple it, 100 times more. That's how traumatic the scene is going to be on the day of resurrection. Their eyes will be downcast. They say, shall we indeed be returned to our former state of life? Even after we are crumbled bones, they say it would be in that case, be a return with loss, but it will only be a single shout. When behold, they find themselves on the surface of the earth. Has there come to you the story of Musa? When his Lord called him to the sacred valley of Tua, saying, go to Fir'aun, verily he has transgressed all bounds, and say to him, would you purify yourself from the sin of disbelief? And that I guide you to your Lord, so you should fear him. Again, here we need to check ourselves. Do we fear God? As we're concluding Ramadan, as we're completing our Dawr of Quran, we should ask ourselves, did we increase in terms of taqwa? Did we increase in terms of tazkiyah? Are we able to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than what we did before? Then Musa alayhi salam showed him the great sign, the miracles, but Fir'aun denied and disobeyed. Then he turned his back, striving against Allah, plotting against Musa. Then he gathered the people and cried aloud, saying, I am your Lord, most high. So Allah seized him with punishment for his last and first transgression. <laughs> Meaning he's punished in Qabr and in this dunya, by means of drowning and definitely he's going to have an ultimate punishment in Jahannam. Verily in this is an instructive admonition for whoever fears Allah. Are you more difficult to be created or is the heaven that he constructed? He raised its height and perfected it. It's night he covers with darkness and it's foreknown he brings out with light. And after that he spreads the earth and brought forth their food in water, its water and its pasture. And the mountains he has fixed firmly to be a provision and benefit for you and your cattle. But when there comes the greatest catastrophe, the day of recompense. And Tam literally means such a calamity that doesn't go away. It cannot be averted, meaning this exam, it will not be delayed due to COVID-19, due to any reason, it will definitely take place. It will not be deferred. The day when man shall remember what he strove for, imagine each one of us standing next to each other. We will not be remembering what she did or what he said. We will only be focusing on what did I do? The 60 years, 70, 80 years of my life, what was I doing? And all those flashbacks are going to be coming to us on that day. That, oh my God, this day I was sinning behind everyone's back. This day I was just wasting time. This day I was cheating. I was being treacherous. <laughs> This day I was delaying salah for no reason. This day I was being undutiful to my parents. And all those embarrassing moments of guilt are going to be recurring over and over again. And Allah subhanahu wa mentions, And Jahannam shall be made apparent in full view for everyone who sees than for him who transgressed all bounds and preferred the life of this world. Verily, his abode will be Jahannam. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us from Jahannam. But as for him who feared standing before his Lord and restrained himself from impure evil desires and lusts, verily Jannah will be his abode. They ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the hour, when will be its appointed time? You have no knowledge to say anything about it to your Lord, belongs the knowledge of the term thereof. Yes, you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are only a warner for those who feared it. The day when they see it, it will be as if they had not been tarried in this world except an afternoon or a morning. And this is the reality of life, subhanAllah. That on the day of resurrection, when we wake up, we're gonna feel that the entire life that we lived in dunya was just equivalent to maybe an afternoon, maybe a morning, that's it. And subhanAllah, we can compare it even to our life now, whatever age we may be, whether we are in our 30s or 40s or 50s, if we look back at our life, we realize that subhanAllah, how fast did all these years went by? Where did I lose all these 30 years of my life? 40 years of my life, what was I doing? What do I have in my Jannah backpack? What am I carrying in my Ahira suitcase? <laughs> And when we actually look back and think about it, subhanAllah, we can easily sum up all those years maybe in a 15 minute talk, maybe in half an hour. Everything seems to have gone by so fast. And if you think about our accomplishments, subhanAllah, very trivial, very minute very few, and even that too, very, very weak and deficient. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our shortcomings, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah, to have the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our humble efforts, inshallah, and forgive our sins. Ameen, ya Rabb. So inshallah, with that said, we are going to conclude our session for today. And tomorrow is going to be our Khatm Quran Dua. So inshallah, we're going to complete our Dawr of Quran. And then we are going to have Dua in English, inshallah, followed by Dua in Urdu. So I recommend all of you to join. And if you want to invite your friends for it, inshallah, you are more than welcome to do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant the blessings of this Quran upon all of us, inshallah, upon our families, upon our peers, our friends, upon our communities, and upon all the people. Ameen, ya Rabbi. جزاكم الله خيرا كثيرا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ولا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك 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 ونتوب إليك ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم أنس وحشتي في قبري اللهم ارحمني بالقرآن العظيم واجعله لي إماما ونورا وهدى ورحمة اللهم ذكرني منهما نسيت وعلمني منهما جهلت ورزقني تلاوته أنا الليل وأنا النهار Ya Allah, divert our restlessness in the grave into peace. Ya Allah, let us receive your mercy by means of the noble Quran. Make it a guide as well as a source of light, guidance, and grace for us. Ya Allah, revive our memory of whatever we were made to forget from this noble Quran. Grant us understanding of whatever part we do not know. Enable us to recite it during the hours of the day and night and make it a mean argumentative support for all of us in all matters, O oh, nourisher of the worlds. Ya yeah, Allah, grant shifa to all the people who are sick, whether it's due to COVID or other reasons. One of my best friends, very close to my heart, her mother, um, subhanAllah, she is diagnosed with COVID-19. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant her a complete shifa. Her mother-in-law is sick and subhanAllah, they're not able to find uh, beds for her, subhanAllah. Um, so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to um, 
grant her the best treatment, inshallah, to grant her the best hospitality, inshallah. And subhanAllah, cure all the people who are suffering through any reason, due to any cause. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to um, grant forgiveness to our deceased. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on them and grant them shannatul firdaus. <laughs> We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Ya Allah, have mercy on our parents, just like they raised us up. Ya Allah, enable our children and our husband to be a source of coolness and eyes for us. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhuriyatina qurrata a'yun wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. Ya Allah, we ask you to forgive our shortcomings. Ya Allah, we, uh, we ask you to guide all the believers and forgive them. Rabbi ja'alni muqima salati ma min dhuriyati. Rabbana mutaqabbal dua. Rabbana qirli wa li walidayya wa lil mu'minina yawma yaqumu al-hisab. Ameen ya Rabb. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Jazakumullahu al-khayran kaseera. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.